Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. Before I continue, I just want to mention that we have updated our Patreon page. We have whole new tiers so that you can help support the show. I love making this podcast, and if you want to support the podcast in any way, I greatly appreciate it. You can support it for as little as $3 a month. You just have to go to patreon.com slash CanadaX. That's E-H-X. Now on to the show. When you make a list of the greatest Canadians in history, certain names will always make the top of the list. There are, of course, people like Tommy Douglas and Terry Fox, as well as other names like John Candy or Harriet Brooks. Another name, which is known to Canadians far and wide, and the world at large, is that of Frederick Banting, the co-discoverer of insulin. A few weeks ago, I put up a playoff bracket of 32 individuals who have been dead for 25 years or more to see who Facebook fans of Canadian History X thought should be on the new $5 bill from the Bank of Canada. After thousands of votes had been cast over the course of several weeks, it came down to just one person that the majority of voters wanted on the new banknote. That person was Sir Frederick Banting. In honour of his victory, we're doing a special episode on Banting, his life, and the discovery that changed the world. I had the pleasure of talking with Grant Maltman, the curator of Banting House, as well as Rebecca Redmond, a relative of Banting who also has type 1 diabetes. Their audio interviews will be sprinkled throughout this episode. Let's begin. Frederick Grant Banting was born on November 14th, 1891, in a small farmhouse near Alliston, Ontario. The youngest of five children to William Banting and Marga Grant, he would spend his youth in the community before heading off to Victoria College in Toronto in 1910. He would spend a year in the general arts program before failing out. That failure would change the world. In 1912, he was accepted into medical school and would officially begin his training as a doctor in September of that year. Over the course of the next two years, Banting attended medical school until a shooting on the other side of the planet changed his priorities and his future. When the First World War broke out at the end of July 1914, Banting would attempt to enlist only two weeks later on August 16th. He was denied due to his poor eyesight, but he would be back again in October and try again. Once again he was refused, but Banting did not give up and in 1915 he successfully joined the army. This is most likely because casualty numbers were rising and the war was not expected to end soon, and the requirements for entry into the army were relaxed. Throughout the summer of 1915, he would train with the military before returning to medical school in the fall. Due to the war and the dire need for doctors, Banting's class of future doctors was fast-tracked through their studies, graduating in December of 1916, one year ahead of schedule. The day after graduation, Banting reported for military duty with the Royal Canadian Medical Corps. At the time, he was also engaged to Edith Roach. At first, Banting was posted to the Toronto Base Hospital, before going to New Brunswick to continue his military training. By March 26, 1917, when he set sail for Britain, he had found himself promoted to the rank of captain. Once overseas, Banting would serve in rear hospitals and aid stations all along the front lines of France. At the Battle of Canal du Nord, which happened at the end of September 1918, he would find himself wounded in the arm from shrapnel. Despite the fact that he could not use his good arm and was likely in terrible pain, he continued to help other injured soldiers for a further 17 hours until he was finally taken away to be treated. Thanks to his actions during the battle to save lives, he was awarded the Military Cross, a medal only 3,000 soldiers received during the First World War. On September 29th, while in hospital, he would write to his mother in a letter that is written with his bad hand due to the injury to his good hand. It says, My dearest mother, this letter will be short left hand. I was slightly wounded yesterday in the right forearm. Had operation last night and shrapnel removed from between bones. No fracture, but unlabone damaged. I feel pretty good, only tired. I have just had a big, hot, lovely dinner. Everyone is as kind as can be. Now please don't worry. I am the luckiest boy in France. I don't know where I am going, address as usual, with love from Fred. Returning home in 1919, Banting went back to work to resume his surgical training. He would study orthopedic medicine and from 1919 to 1920 was a resident surgeon at the hospital for sick children. Unable to gain a place on hospital staff, he decided to move to London, Ontario to set up a medical practice. 
A major reason for the move was likely that Edith lived near there teaching at the Interpol District Collegiate Institute. While working at his medical practice, he also taught orthopedics and anthropology at the University of Western Ontario to supplement his income. From 1921 to 1922, he would lecture on pharmacology at the University of Toronto and would receive his medical degree in 1922. Going back a few years, Banting had been asked to give a talk on the pancreas of the University of Western Ontario on November 1, 1920. To get up to speed on the new developments, he began to read reports related to the pancreas, and it was there he saw several reports by various doctors that suggested diabetes was caused by the lack of a protein hormone in the pancreas, which had been called insulin. It was believed that this protein helped the body control the metabolism of sugar, and the lack of it would cause an increase in sugar in the blood. There had been attempts to extract insulin from ground-up pancreas cells, but this was unsuccessful. The challenge for many doctors in the field now was to find a way to extract insulin from the pancreas prior to the destruction of the cells by an enzyme in the pancreas. Banting then read a report by Moses Barron from 1920 that described the experimental closure of the pancreatic duct by ligature, and this would further influence Banting in his thinking on the matter. This procedure caused the destruction of the cells that secrete trypsin, which breaks down insulin, but left the eyelets of the pancreas intact. Banting soon realized that this procedure could be used to extract insulin. He then approached Jay McLeod, the professor of physiology at the University of Toronto, who would provide him with facilities and a research assistant named Charles Best. Best and Banting then began to work on producing insulin through this new means. The experiments began using living dogs at first, but by November 1921 the quantities needed could not be obtained from dogs. Banting at this point realized that he could get insulin from fetal pancreas. At the William Davies Slaughterhouse, he removed the pancreas from fetal calves and found the extracts were just as good as those removed from dogs. By December of that year, he had succeeded in extracting insulin from adult pancreas. For the next half century, beef and pork would be the main source of commercial insulin until genetically engineered bacteria was used in the late 20th century. With this new method at his disposal, Banting established a private practice in Toronto to treat diabetic patients. His first American patient would be Elizabeth Hughes Gossett, the daughter of the current Secretary of State. She would live until the 1980s thanks to this new procedure. Banting decided to sell the patent on the new discovery of insulin production for one dollar, stating that it belonged to the world, not to him. Rebecca Redman speaks on the generosity of her ancestor. A lot of the way people describe him makes me think of my grandmother a lot. Um, she'd give you the shirt off her back. She'd rip the shirt off someone else to give it to someone else who needs it. So she was a very um, interesting woman. But I think what he did speaks volumes on his character. People also don't realize that John McLeod stood to make a lot of money. And by gathering up call up and best Banting kind of curtailed that right from the get-go. And I think a hundred years later, we're still seeing that fight for profit versus accessibility when it comes to insulin. Dr. Charles Best spoke years later about the fact that neither he nor Banting accepted any royalties for the creation of insulin. I remember during the uh, insulin celebration, a distinguished man in England uh, had that idea that we must have made a, a million. Well, I won't go into details, but... Uh, I know Fred Banting left a very small estate. He, he never made anything out of insulin, and uh, I never did either, except that, uh, of course, we got a good opportunity to work and the university professorship. After the insulin work, we published four papers, I think, together, and he never went back to work on diabetes. He did practice and look after patients, as I've said, but he uh, soon became engaged in, in cancer research with Dr. Wilbur Franks and many others, and had a considerable success. Today, when we look at the list of greatest Canadian inventions, insulin often ranks at or near the top. In 2007, in a CBC special poll, insulin was actually placed as the greatest Canadian invention in history. Rebecca elaborates. Um, I would say it's up there. It has to be. There's so many fantastic people in this world that owe their lives to that magical little liquid, like myself included. Um, I have a friend in Wales, and she works in the diabetes community, and there was a woman whose grandson 
uh, was speaking at an event and his grandmother was one of the first people treated with insulin uh, way back when. And he's like, from this stems like all of these people. So I guess going back to, <laughs> to what I said before, we, the world would miss out on, on a number of fantastic people without the discovery of insulin and I think it's also led to other things it's inspired amazing technology for treating diabetes like everything from insulin pumps to continuous glucose monitors so it was a catalyst I think in the medical field that way. The discovery would change the lives of many people saving millions of lives. One life that was changed was that of Jack Herity who spoke with CBC in 1978 after the death of Dr. Charles Best. Uh, 1921, I was rooming over on St. George Street. And from there, would occasionally cut across the university grounds, past the Convocation Hall building, and uh, we would look in the windows there to watch a couple of lads working over some uh, kettles and things. Uh, we had been told that they were uh, creating or developing insulin, which would do something for diabetes. At the time, I had no idea that it might ever be beneficial to me. I probably could have lived for a year or two without insulin, <clears throat> but there's no doubt in my mind that uh, that would have been the end of it. Insulin uh, insurance saved my life. For his work in the discovery and use of insulin, Banting would receive the Nobel Prize for Medicine, jointly with McLeod. To date, Banting is the youngest person in history to receive the Nobel Prize in Medicine. He would take half the money from the Nobel Prize and give it to Best, who had assisted him every step of the way. This was done in response to the fact that Banting felt McLeod should not have jointly received the award and that Best should have since he had worked with Banting day in and day out, while at times McLeod was skeptical about the success of the project. With this new discovery and the Nobel Prize, Banting went from an obscure doctor to a celebrated Canadian, and the honours quickly began to flood in. It was argued he was the most famous Canadian in the world, and the pressure to help with more diseases was thrust upon him. This would put a great deal of pressure on Banting, and some said that he would have been a happier man to remain just a small-town doctor rather than a world-famous and idolized individual. Grant Maltman talks about the fame that Banting suddenly found. Uh, he gave a speech shortly after winning the Nobel Prize, or you know, paraphrasing, you know, three years ago today is my idea, I became engaged to diabetes two years ago. Uh, last year when the experiments took off, I was wed to diabetes, and today with the Nobel Prize, I'm applying for my divorce from diabetes because he knew uh, this, was, this was his lot in life, that he had become to represent that singular moment in time, and as much as he understood this was something that was going to happen and it was going to be thrust upon him, it was something also he often tried to escape from. In 1922, he was appointed as a senior demonstrator in medicine at the University of Toronto. In 1923, he was appointed to the brand new Banting and Best Chair of Medical Research, which was funded by the Ontario government. Also in 1923, the Government of Canada gave Banting a lifetime annuity to continue his medical work amounting to $7,500 per year. In today's funds, that would equal $111,000. On August 25, 1923, 76,500 people came out to the opening day of the Canadian Exhibition in Toronto. Banting stood in front of the crowd and read a speech recognizing the work of Best and other colleagues and thanking the governments for providing funds to support medical research. Banting's parents were also in attendance, and his mother, when asked if she was proud of her son, stated, Not proud, thankful. In 1924, he would be granted five honorary doctorates from the University of Western Ontario, the University of Toronto, Queen's University, the University of Michigan, and Yale University. It was in this year that he and Edith would end their long engagement, Edith had grown tired of waiting, and both had grown apart. That same year, he would marry Marion Robertson, an x-ray technician, with whom he would have one child named William, who was born in 1929 and lived until 1998. The couple would divorce in 1932. As for William, he would go on to work for the CBC and BBC, creating wildlife documentaries. In 1970, he would be awarded the Best Canadian Documentary Film at the Canadian Film Awards. For Wild Africa, The Way It Was. 
Williams spoke with CBC in 1984 about his childhood and being the son of a Canadian hero. It's funny. I, we'd been close in a, in, a, in, a, in a strange way. He was, to me, he was a, a, a large presence and he meant discipline and hard work and uh, honesty and all those things that little kids are tend, to, tend to forget about. Yeah. So I think he probably made me feel that I was having more demanded of me than I could possibly deliver. Uh, but um, on the other hand, he was a buddy too. He used to, we used to go for walks in the Don Valley and he could make uh, whistles out of, out of uh, willow branches in the spring. And he knew the birds and he was an expert at finding four-leaf clovers. He's all sorts of things that little children remember about their parents that I can still remember about him. In 1925, the Banting Research Foundation would be created, providing funds to support health and biomedical research across Canada. Around the same time that he had made his discovery of the insulin, Banting would develop a strong interest in painting. His first pieces of art were on the back of cardboard in which his shirts were packed by dry cleaners. As his renown grew, he would become friends with several Group of Seven artists, sharing the love of the rugged Canadian landscape. For the next two decades, Banting would be one of Canada's best-known amateur painters. He would say once, The more I think of the city, the more I want to live in the country. The more I think about being a professor of research, the more I want to be an artist. During his life, he created over 200 paintings. Here, William Banting talks about his father's painting and love of it. But the interesting thing about his, his painting, you know, um, when he went out with Jackson, they used to work together on, on these hey, little... this is. Yeah. <laughs> with, on these little 8x11 birch panels. And... Uh, in the conditions they were working, they had to go fast. The, you know, the light was changing quickly, and, and, the, and they hadn't got much time, and their fingers were cold, so they'd go like mad to get them done. And then they'd bring them back, and uh, both he and Jackson would try and work them into larger pictures with the same subject matter, using the same ideas. Grant Maltman also saw painting as something Banting loved to do when not in the lab. Well, uh, he became good friends, uh, first with uh, Lauren Harris of the Group of Seven, and then uh, in 1920. 627 he met A.Y. Jackson and they became fast friends lifelong friends uh, painting together for more than 13 years it was a, a hobby uh, that Banting started here in London uh, one patient in his first 28 days gave him a lot of free time and so to pass that time he took up painting it was something like all kids do dabbled with in their youth but here in London uh, it was became this this escape for him uh, worry from his debts, from his lack of patience, and his first showing was in 1925 at Hart House, a faculty show. Lauren Harris saw the work and uh, rebutted some of the, the criticisms. Uh, one art critic says the only, skirt, uh, the only art school Dr. Banting represented was the medical school, and maybe he should stick to what he knows. Another one says, well, there's a Susan of the seven, and it was at that point that uh, Lauren Harris nominated him for the Arts and Letters Club in Toronto. Uh, they talked about what the Group of Seven was doing with their work, and Banting wasn't a big fan in the beginning. And then he came to understand and appreciate what they were doing. And at that point, he met A.Y. Jackson, and as I said, they uh, toured across Canada and painted uh, together for about 13 years. In 1927, Banting would take part in an Arctic trip with a Group of Seven painter named A.Y. Jackson. It was on this trip that Banting realized that the crew and passengers on the Hudson's Bay Company paddle wheeler, the SS Distributor, was responsible for spreading influenza along the Slave River and Mackenzie River, devastating the indigenous populations there. The journey would begin on July 7, 1927, when he received a wire asking if he wanted to take part in the journey. On July 16th, he was setting off on the steamship Bealthick. On July 18th, Banting with Wright saw our first icebergs after breakfast. Fog lifted about 10 numerous icebergs. Alex and I did pencil drawings of many of the larger ones. Later, Banting would write about a hike he took. A little waterfall had worn the cliff away, leaving a more gentle slope. At this place, we climbed to the plateau which was covered with sharp, jagged, broken rock on which not even moss could grow. After crossing a mile or so, we looked upon Fram's Fjord, which was brilliantly illuminated in the midnight sun. Words failed to describe the majesty and beauty of the scene which met our gaze. Mr. Jackson and I lost no time in getting out our paint boxes. Grant Maltman speaks about Banting's trip to the north. This was, a, this was an interesting trip. Uh, uh, A.Y. Jackson was asked by the government to paint the north for Canadians so they could see what was there. And Jackson invited Banting to come up. Banting had an interest in, in uh, northern peoples and uh, wanted to go, but the government was, was afraid something might happen. So 
he had to get his own insurance and basically tell the government that if anything happened, uh, they wouldn't be held responsible. And this is, uh, as they're leaving North Sydney Harbour, Banting throws his shirt collar in the ship and says, goodbye to civilization for the next six weeks. And uh, this was a, a trip uh, visiting the RCMP outposts. And, and Banting was uh, relatively unknown, uh, obviously, in that, in that part of the world. So it was a great time for him to, to escape, to learn how to paint, to draw, uh, Lots of frustration uh, because this is the first time he'd gone on such an extensive trip uh, with Jackson. They'd been gone uh, to the Eastern Townships earlier that year on a short trip. But this was six weeks of what's wrong with this and start over again and uh, often found himself getting lost in his work. The trip would also open Banting's eyes to the impact white settlers were having on the indigenous people of the Arctic. He would talk about this with a reporter from the Toronto Star after the trip, believing he was off the record, but the interview would be published nonetheless. This deeply angered Banting, who had promised the Department of the Interior he would not make any statements to the press without clearing them first. The article quoted Banting as saying that the fur trade heavily favoured the Hudson's Bay Company, who would buy $100,000 worth of fox skins but only pay the indigenous $5,000 in goods. The Fur Trade Commissioner of the Hudson's Bay Company criticized Banting for his statement, and while Banting was angry about the betrayal of his confidence, he refused to retract his statement. In his report to the Department of the Interior, he would reiterate his thoughts on the indigenous situation in the North. He would state, Infant mortality was high because of the undernourishment of the mother before birth. He'd also state that, The white man's food leads to the decay of native teeth. He would go on to state the following, the gravest danger faces the Eskimo in his transfer of a race-long hunter to a dependent trapper. White flour, sea biscuits, tea, and tobacco do not provide sufficient fuel to warm and nourish him. In 1935, King George V would bestow upon Banting a very rare honour for a Canadian by knighting him. From that day forward, Dr. Frederick Banting would be Sir Frederick Banting. In 1937, Banting married Henrietta Ball, with whom he would stay married to for the rest of his life. In 1938, Banting would develop an interest in aviation medicine and begin to work with the Royal Canadian Air Force in researching the physiological problems encountered by high-altitude pilots. During the Second World War, Banting would look at the issue of aviators blacking out due to high G-forces. He would work with Wilbur Franks to develop a G-suit to stop pilots from blacking out when turning or diving. He also worked on a treatment of mustard gas burns, going so far as to test the gas and antidotes on himself to ensure they were effective. Grant Maltman highlights some of the accomplishments of Banting in the military, both in the First World War and Second World War. Oh, and there's so much more that he was involved with. Uh, Going back even before the discovery of insulin, he was a military cross winner, one of the highest awards in the British Empire for bravery, while wounded at the Battle of Canal du Nord in in 1918. Uh, During the Second World War, uh, even before the war started, General Andrew McNaughton invites him to join the National Research Council, and he helps coordinate our military and medical research programs. Chairman of two, he's involved with about 22 other research committees for the Allied war effort. The development of the Franks flying suit, the first G suit for fighter pilots, uh, comes out of the Banting Institute uh, with Banting working with Dr. Franks. Canada's first man-rated centrifuge gets built in Toronto because the Banting goes to the federal government and says, I need $29,000, and he builds our first centrifuge at a secret base in the north end of Toronto. Uh, decompression chambers to simulate high-altitude flights. Uh, Banting returns here to London, Ontario uh, to speak to a town on gown, and about a 20-minute speech on air superiority, aviation medicine, this is what's going to win the war, and, and while the London Committee, which is made up with you know families like the Labats uh, here in town and the research community at Western, he formed this research council, and uh, he gives Banning gives him the speech and says, "Look, in, I can't stay. I'll sign the odd letter, but I'm hoping to get back to England. I'll leave you with this: the Germans have 88 of these machines. They're called decompression chambers. They're used to simulate high altitude flights. And the Allies, we have the one I built last year in Toronto. And at which point, Sherwood Fox, who was president of Western at the time, stands up and says, "Well, gentlemen, I guess we have our experiment." asked for five hundred dollars from everybody and that chamber is designed built paid for installed at western's university and within um three months and we have our first uh uh project uh, which leads to the development of the pressurized 
cockpits in late 44, early 45 by the experiments connected test chamber and others. Banting's son William adds that during the war, he remembers a special moment his father helped create for him. I wasn't aware that he was a hero, but I, but I was aware that he had some power that other people didn't have. Uh, early in the war, when the aviation medicine thing was, was beginning to get going, uh, they didn't have a, a fast airplane to test high-speed turns in, on, for the effects of G. And uh, somewhere they got hold of, a, and I, I believe it was a Spitfire, but I might be wrong, but it was a very fast airplane. It must have, might have been an American fighter, but it was certainly the fastest airplane in Canada of its day. And uh, one day, my father said to me, if you look out if you, at, at lunchtime, go out to the back of the school on Rosedale Heights Drive, and you'll see a fast airplane go by. So I told my buddies, and we went out at lunchtime, and this airplane came by at about 100 feet. Must have been doing 300 miles an hour, which is very fast. Very fast. fast. In those days. <laughs> well, I, I, I lived on that one for, for months. I was the hero, and I realized then that he had some special things that he could do that others couldn't. During the winter of 1941, Banting, who was now a major in the Army, was told to go to Britain by the Canadian military so he could coordinate the military research of the Allies. Sadly, on February 20th, 1941, Banting was a passenger in a Lockheed L-14 Super Elector Hudson plane when both its engines failed as it left Gander, Newfoundland. The plane crashed in Musgrave Harbor, killing the navigator and co-pilot. Banting would die the next day from his wounds and he is buried at the Mount Pleasant Cemetery in Toronto. This story from the CBC in 1991 looks at the death of Banting as told by someone who was nearby. They said, that's the plane going in. Seems to be in trouble, that plane seems to be in trouble. The plane crashed 16 kilometers away in the bush. With a handful of radios and no road out of town, they didn't really know what exactly had happened until... Saturday night, CBC at that time, uh, Earl Cameron reading the news he said there's been a plane crash in the in the walls of Newfoundland with a famous doctor on board after his death and for decades to follow Banting would continue to receive honors for his work with diabetes the SS Frederick Banting would set sail on December 20th 1943 the 500 foot long ship cost two million dollars to construct and was christened by Lady Henrietta Banting who was in her fifth year of medical school, and at the time she was a private in the Canadian Women's Army Corps. Dr. Best was also there at the ceremony. This was the first time the United States named a ship after a non-American. An exception was made for Banting's service to humanity. The ship would sail from January 19, 1944 to December 18, 1945. In 1947, it was sold to a private owner, and in 1969, it was scrapped. As for Lady Henrietta, she would graduate from medical school in 1945 and become a successful doctor researching cancer treatments. Banting's name would be put to the Banting Lectures, a yearly lecture series by experts in diabetes. Several places would receive this name, including three schools in Ontario and one in British Columbia. Several other things are named for him. The Major Sir Frederick Banting Award for Military Health Research is awarded annually by the Surgeon General to the researcher whose work presented at the annual Military and Veterans Health Research Forum is deemed to contribute most to military health. The Banting Postdoctoral Fellowship Program awards $70,000 per year to researchers in health, natural sciences, engineering, social studies, and the humanities. His honours don't end there, though. Banting House, his former home in London, Ontario, is now a National Historical Site of Canada. Grant Maltman talks about the building and what is found there. Well, Banting House is uh, the birthplace of insulin, affectionately known since 1923. It's the house that uh, Dr. Banting uh, owned and lived in uh, from 1920 to 1921, and we're a National Historic Site because... It was here at 2 o'clock in the morning on October 31st, 1920, that he came up with this idea that led to the discovery of insulin. The Banting Interpretive Centre in Musgrave Harbour is named for him, as is Banting Crater on the Moon. The crater was named for Banting in August of 1973 when the International Astronomical Union met in Australia and decided that scientists from all fields could be honoured with craters on the Moon. The crater is on the near side of the moon, measuring 5 kilometers in diameter, and is between the sites of where Apollo 15 and Apollo 16 landed. In 1974, William Banting would say of the honor for his father, I'm delighted my family's name is now on the moon. 
it gives you a bit of a weird feeling. The Flame of Hope would be lit by Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, in 1989. This flame will stay lit until a cure is found for diabetes, and will only be put out by the researchers who discover a cure. The flame is located at the Sir Frederick Banting Square in London, Ontario. On the same note, a time capsule was buried in the square in 1991 to honour the 100th anniversary of his birth, and it will be exhumed if a cure for diabetes is found. In 2004, Banting was chosen as the fourth greatest Canadian in history behind only Tommy Douglas, Terry Fox, and Pierre Trudeau. On November 14, 2016, the 125th anniversary of his birth, he was also honoured with a Google Doodle. Now I'd like to end this episode with Grant Maltman talking about the legacy of Banting. Well, I, I think two things there, two great words, uh, peak and legacy. Uh, yes, uh, the discovery of insulin is Banting's legacy, and it's not a bad legacy to hang one's hat on, sort of save your millions. And as you say, peak it. When you win the Nobel Prize at age 31, or discover make it at age 29, you have peaked a little early, uh, and this is becomes a bit of a burden on Banting because everyone's expecting great things from him later. You know, when are you going to? You know, he spent years working on cancer or his military research, working on this project and that project. He was never going to to raise to that same level as the discoverer insulin. So it does become uh, a bit of a burden on him. Um, critics would say, you know, this is something that uh, you are a one, you know, one trick pony and for banting, you know, tell them I never discover anything again when you make a minor breakthrough. So it was something that uh, he was well aware of and something that uh, was of some concern to him, which I think explains why he continually tried to, to get away from uh, his role as, as this discoverer of insulin and his descendant, Rebecca Redman, also talks about the legacy and the impact Banting had on the world. Uh, I'm all for it. <laughs> if you ask my 10-year-old son who loves all the comic book heroes, Banting is his hero. I really think he is a, a real Canadian hero. People forget that he has done a lot more than, than just the discovery of the idea of insulin to treat diabetes. He was a celebrated uh, war hero who did surgery on himself to explore new techniques. He was a painter and good friends with uh, several members of the group of seven. So he's an all-around interesting man, I think, um, which I, I think it lends itself to being Canadian. We kind of like to do a lot of different things. <laughs> um, but I, I'm all for it, I think. In the age of technology, certain things get lost, and I would hate for what he's done for diabetes to be lost in all of that. So I'm, I'm a huge advocate. I'd love to see him on the $5 bill. I think it being blue and blue being the color of diabetes is kind of a, a perfect match, but that's just my personal opinion. <laughs> <laughs> NHL Hall of Famer Bobby Clark. Boxer Buster Douglas author Anne Rice, actress Elizabeth Perkins, actor Peter O'Toole, actress Mary Tyler Moore, comedian Jerry Lewis, and singer Brett Michaels. Those are just some of the people who owe their lives to Sir Frederick Banting and Dr. Charles Best and their monumental discovery with insulin. No one can deny Banting is a well-deserving person for the $5 bill. Information for this piece comes from Wikipedia, Banting House, the University of Toronto, in the Canadian Encyclopedia, as well as CBC Archives. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Canadian History X, and if you did, please give a rating and review. You can reach me at CanadianHistoryX, that's E-H-X, at gmail.com, and please don't forget to support us on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash CanadaX, E-H-X. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.